Hello, hello everyone. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, I'm so thrilled to see so many of you signing in. I love watching the numbers just zooming up. Um, and I'm delighted that we can get together in this way to bring and beam brilliant speakers to you at the click of a Zoom button. Um, I'm sorry that we can't all be in the same room, but I'm so glad that we're all here to support also a really worthy cause. I'm sure you know that all the proceeds for this event go to the young adult cancer charity Trekstock. Um, so I'm thrilled to welcome you. Um, it could be this evening or this afternoon or this morning, depending on where in the world that you're tuning in from, on behalf of both the How To Academy uh, and Fane Productions. Um, and that while launch plans sort of left, right and centre have been somewhat scuppered by lockdown and recent uh, events, we can still celebrate success that, that really deserves celebrating. Um, and that's not least with our guest this evening, who it's such a treat to have with us two days before the launch of her fifth book. Um, and one that with all, as all she does, um, is clearly a huge labour of love, written and edited and tested and shot, I think, while pregnant with your first child and then done with a tiny baby in tow um, and launched while dealing with the effects of this pandemic um, on, on her business um, and then becoming pregnant again. So it was, she says, a truly emotional roller coaster. Um, but this is, this is quick and easy. Um, which is really the inspiration for the event this evening. There's a lot more to talk about. This is filled with, of course, many of her wonderful plant-based recipes, um, but this time to be as accessible and doable as possible. And I, I defy um, the most resolute of skeptics not to feel that these recipes and these pictures make their mouths water. I've been staring at it all day. Um, but these award-winning cookbooks are only just part of, of course, this brand which began in 2012 at a time when plant-based eating was really a quite alien concept to most people um, and she's really blazed a trail for a health movement that's gathered momentum ever since and really stayed right at the forefront joined by her husband uh, and now business partner Matt who I think we'll be hearing about later I hope and of course um, dog Austin uh, again we'll probably hear about him a bit later too uh, as I'm sure many of you know, her blog, deliciouslyella.com, has had over 110 million hits in the last three years. It's, it's probably more now I'm speaking. And um, 1.7 million followers on Instagram. As I say, five best-selling books. She created a chart-topping app um, and together with Matt opened a deli in London and launched, I think it's eight product lines. Again, it's probably more in the last week since we've written this blurb. Um, and many of you will have come across them. They're stocked in over 5,500 stores all across the UK and Waitrose and Sainsbury's, Tesco's, WH Smith, many more. Um, but the list of successes, I could go on and we'd be here probably for the rest of the evening. So I should stop talking. I know that you've all tuned in to hear from Ella and not from me. Um, and we'll be in conversation for about 40 to 45 minutes uh, and then there'll be a chance for questions at the end. And also in case I forget to say at the end, the event is being recorded. So you'll all be sent um, a, a recording in an email tomorrow. Um, and I think you can probably buy the book online from an independent bookshop. There'll be a link to that too. So thank you all so much for joining. Um, Ella, I said that uh, this launch obviously comes at the end of a, what's a bit of a, been an emotional roller coaster um, and a series of them. I think it's been that for many of us, highs and lows throughout the last few months. But I know it's particularly tough for small businesses. It's particularly tough for working mums. Um, you're, you fit all the categories. H how have you found it? Do you know what? I think, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me and welcome everyone. Um, it's so nice to be able to do this event virtually and I'm really appreciative of it. So thank you for having me. But yeah, do you know what? I keep saying to everyone, I feel like the last few months, it depends when you ask, because I think as a small business, obviously there have been loads of challenges. Um, and, um, but then at the same time, you know, we've got a little one at home and getting the extra time with her has been absolutely incredible and just such a blessing. And yeah, I went back to work on Quick and Easy when she was just four weeks old. Um, she came to every shoot with us. I was literally like breastfeeding her and doing some food styling at the same time at points. I mean, so it was a pretty kind of 
intense beginning to motherhood and she is a big part of this book um, in that sense and so having the opportunity to actually be at home and around her every single day has been something that I haven't really had up until this point and that has been just unbelievable we both we've both enjoyed that so 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 much and it's definitely created such a huge positive and and I have to say being pregnant and being able to not commute is a dream come true because this time last year I was waddling down Oxford Street and 30 degree heat um, where our office is and it was a bit hot and a bit sweaty and a bit uncomfortable so trying to trying to work on the silver linings. Yeah and I mean you are you know everything I read about you everything you see and I've actually met you you know in full full work mode you, you know you're an incredibly busy person you're just achieving you know endlessly achieving things um for the business and setting goals and, and achieving them so have you found that side of it um frustrating or have you sort of been able to recalibrate a bit and and probably a bit of both yeah i think a bit of both i mean the beginning and i'm sure so many other people have would have found the same was quite frustrating we had really big plans we were meant to launch um, our product range in Germany and in America in April and we were planning to be in both places and we were going to be spending a few weeks in in the US out in California marking that launch we had everything packaged everything printed everything ready to go and you know had to cancel that had to move the date of this and so it definitely was something where we had put a lot of time and energy into um, moving forward with the business and we had huge plans for the year and then suddenly all those plans go arise um, as I think has been the case for so many businesses and I think it has been an interesting test for kind of resourcefulness and creativity in solving those problems but I guess that's that's, I guess, one of the beauties of being a small business and being kind of only barely out of that startup phase is that's still so much your mentality. I mean, we, you know, Matt and I have been running the kind of more business side of Dishella only for five years. And so, you know, I know you saw us when we opened our first deli and, you know, it was complete madness. And we were literally in there seven days a week, like 15, 16 hours a day. And it was chaos. And so I think we still have quite a lot of that left in our system. And so quite used to a kind of slightly chaotic, never, you know, always changing way of life. And so I think that probably put us in quite a good position um, to respond to the kind of ever changing nature of the last couple of months. I mean, you say, yeah, you were in there, I was going to come to this later, but while you mention it in there, as you look, 24 hours a day, practically sleeping in your office. I mean, it's a very, very hands-on personal brand to you, isn't it? it you know, you want to be part of it. Uh, is that sometimes quite hard to let go of you know I think you said you were cleaning all the bathrooms you were you were everything yeah I mean when we first started we literally did everything um and anyone I'm sure who's ever worked in a startup's the same you have a job title but you might as well not have a job title you do everything and we wanted to be really hands-on as well to understand every aspect of our business and, and what was really happening and getting that kind of direct feedback and so we had a system when we opened the first deli where I did the tills so that I would meet customers when they first came in and get an understanding of what they were looking for and then Matt was um, table cleaner and so he would get everything at the end and so be able to ask you how it was and get feedback um, and so that was that was an amazing system. And we really, really tried to do that still. I mean, when Sky was born, we were launching quite a few new products. And after like three or four days after she was born, Matt was back in the factories and he had quite a few night shifts um, on new product development at that point. And, um, and so it is still like, I think it's interesting because so much of what you see of Delicious Yell is through social media and it's through Instagram and it, I guess it is the kind of, it's the recipe side and it's, it's the ideas and inspiration and what to make for dinner tonight side. And you don't always see that side of it. And um, it's not often that photogenic or, or kind of the kind of thing you're able to share as much, but there's a kind of never ending kind of cog behind that. And um, Matt especially is still so hands on. And I did find it quite hard especially beginning my pregnancy with Sky was felt so ill had very very bad morning sickness and exhaustion and I I for the first time because this show has been running since 2012 now so eight and a half years and I feel like even though it's grown a lot you know there's about 20 people in our office now and I very much feel that it's something that's not owned by me anymore I mean kind of technically it's owned by our team and Matt and I um, but it's I feel like it's something that we all share and I feel it's a collective and I 
I had a real kind of sense of guilt in having to slow down. And I really, really struggled with that actually a bit when Sky was born. I said to Matt, I was like, I'm going to switch off. I'm, I'm going to take at least six weeks. And after 24 hours, I was, I was back online because I just felt this, I don't know, I felt this kind of complete pull and I feel this sort of responsibility. I feel so passionate about what it is that we do at Delicious Ciela and about trying to inspire people just to feel that little bit healthier, that little bit happier. And I feel like if there's anything that I can do to support anyone as an individual, I want to do it. And I, I do think sometimes I probably do it to my detriment. And there are definitely times where it's like 5 a.m. and I'm sitting in bed replying to people's Instagram direct messages being like yes you can swap almonds for cashews in that recipe no problem <laughs> part of me thinks I get some more sleep but I just I don't know I just I just love it I love it and it just it made such a huge difference it completely changed my life in every sense of the word and so if I could do that in any shape or form for anyone else I I feel this kind of overwhelming pull to do so I, I, I'm really interested to come back to that, you know, that idea of to your detriment and the fact that you extraordinarily sort of answer everybody's, um, you know, with 1.7 million followers, somehow you find the time to, to still reply um, and, and answer and like people's comments. And I was noticing that even with the event coming up, which I find absolutely extraordinary. I think you must be very much on your own and unique in that. And I'd love to come back to talk a bit more about social media, which is such a huge part of it um, in a moment. But, you know, while it's familiar to some, I'm sure, who are listening, you know, some people have joined you along the way and they, they weren't there at the start of, of the Delicious Liella journey and don't know the before and after story. And it, it is the case that people will find it hard to believe who don't know that you, you once disliked healthy food and healthy eating. So, so perhaps you can tell us about what it was that happened, I think it was in 2011, that sort of created your your big conversion yeah actually hated healthy food thought it was horrendous and I know my mum's watching and she's like her favorite story she'll tell everyone is how much I'm one of four children and I think in that sense I was the kind of complete nightmare and I just completely categorically refused fruit and vegetables every now and again I'd say I like a banana and she would try and get me to eat one I cut it into circles and they put it into circles on a plate and then I'd go eeny, meeny, miny, mo, I'll eat you. And then go all again, again and it would take like an hour. I mean, I absolutely hated it. I thought it was rabbit food. I thought it was terrible. I thought it was so boring. And then when I was at university, <clears throat> this was in 2011, out of absolutely nowhere, I became very ill um, with a condition that impaired the functioning of my autonomic nervous system. And it affected pretty much my whole body it was characterized by an inability to control my heart rate. So my heart rate when I was sitting or when I was lying would be quite, actually it was relatively low, it would be around 60. And then on standing, it would spike to about 180, 190 within a couple of seconds. Your blood pressure drops, creates intense dizziness, exhaustion, blackout. I had very, very bad chronic fatigue, um, all kinds of pains, aches, chronic headaches, um, lots and lots of pain in my body. Um, I had really, really bad bladder infections. I was on con continuous antibiotics for two and a half years. I had periods where I had to go into hospital for antibiotic drips. Um, and I was on steroids and uh, literally a spreadsheet of medications. Um, I was 21 at this point. And sort of, I mean, overnight, my whole life changed. I couldn't do anything and I couldn't live in anywhere near the way that I thought I was before I mean I could literally barely walk down the street um, and I tried all these medications and these steroids and it's a very kind of random illness it's called postural tachycardia syndrome it's not something the doctors know a huge amount about it's, it's not very common and it's quite a trial or error um, with all the medications most of them are all repurposed from other things and they, they just didn't really have much impact on me and they certainly didn't help me get to a place anywhere near where I could actually function enough to do normal things like get a job and I really 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 struggled um, with my mental health through that I was in a pretty dark place um, and I kind of completely gave into it for a while and I just literally sat in bed and watched all the Kardashians all of Grey's Anatomy um, refresh Facebook 101 times to look at what other people were doing which didn't help in any shape or form with mental health um, 
And after about a year or so, I hit a rock bottom and I realized that I needed to do something. I needed to try and change something. And I, I became very interested in a lifestyle and a holistic approach and whether or not there was anything in there that would possibly help. And I started to learn and to read everything that I could about nutrition, about the way the body worked. And the more that I understood about the way that the body worked, the more it started to make sense to me that trying to give my body as much, you know, goodness and nutrition as I could would make sense. You know, just, I think we're always told to do these things. We're told to eat our five a day and we're, you know, we're told to do this and we're told to do that. And we don't necessarily understand why. And as I started to understand why, you know, that you need certain amounts of fiber because your gut thrives off, that your gut microbiome needs that fiber. Um, that's, that's literally their food. And your gut's intricately connected to your brain through the gut brain axis and to every other organ in your body. And you start to understand, okay, that's why I need vitamin A. That's why I need vitamin K. And it starts to make sense. And I was like, well, I'm not really doing any of that. So I became very interested in how I could cook, but I found as I wanted to include all this plant-based food in my life, I found that I just didn't have the resources out there. And it kind of fitted into three camps at that point. You had, I mean, because veganism was completely kind of so far from the mainstream at this point. It was very niche. It was very weird. No one had ever heard of plant-based. And I, there was kind of, there were things coming out of sort of the West Coast of America and LA, um, and it was, it was really interesting, but quite a lot of it was a little bit, tricky i mean it was kind of like dehydrate something for eight hours and then sprout it and do this and do that and i was also living in scotland in a uni house and i was like mm, that's not really what we're going for here and you needed lots of equipment and it just was very unfamiliar for someone that was like much more of like a burger and a pizza and a ben and jerry's and haribo kind of class, kind of girl and then you had the more kind of ethical side of veganism where it was more focused on meat mimics so it was a lot of you know, um, vegan sausages and vegan burgers, but it was less focused on fresh and less focused on health, which is what I was looking for. Um, and then you had the, just like the kind of uber healthy, like I remember reading a very interesting book, which gave me lots of ideas and really inspired me. But then literally the recipes at the end were like wrap spinach and kale and cucumber. And I was like, oh God, no flavor. And again, I, I didn't like vegetables. And so I needed converting. And so my godmother um, had had ME when she was a similar age to me, which um, for those who don't know is, is kind of like an intense version of chronic fatigue. And she said the thing that saved her and her mental health was a hobby. In her case, it was photography. And I took a lot from that. And I thought, you know what, I do need a hobby because actually feeling like you're not making any progress or learning anything in your life and just sort of wasting away watching Kim Kardashian all day every day it's, it's not helpful necessarily all the time and so I thought okay well that's what I'll do I'll, I'll learn I'll learn to cook I'll learn to like these foods I'll learn to to make them in a way that means I want to eat them and I'll, I'll learn to take pictures of them and, and that's what I'll do and so literally overnight my friend showed me what blogs were and set me up on WordPress and um and Delicious Yellow was born and um it's just been this kind of completely unexpected roller coaster since then. It started off as a very niche online community um, that grew really, really slowly. And it partly grew because I had nothing to do. So I did this all day, every day. And anytime someone came across it, I was so excited that anyone else was interested in this kind of niche, weird space that I would spend so much time engaging with them and trying to understand what it is that they wanted and why they were there. And and that really, really helped the audience develop. Um, and then our first book came out at the beginning of 2015. And that just changed everything overnight. For some reason, it kind of caught a wind and people became very interested in, in what had been, as I said, something quite niche. And, and it kind of, yeah, it changed overnight. And suddenly we weren't a niche online community anymore. It was, and people were talking about you rather than to you. And it was a, yeah, a humongous transformation. And it's it's kind of just, gone on from there i mean this way of eating as you say this, that's gone from niche to mainstream um but i think that the skepticism or the varying reasons why people might roll their eyes like your friends did at the beginning and the sort of criticisms that you had then or might have faced then or that just people being unsure that's actually still ever present isn't it and you know it, i love eating this way i absolutely love it but i i was preparing for this interview thinking 
I have a tendency to roll my eyes and 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 feel this sense of embarrassment. And I was sort of thinking, well, you know, why do I have that with such a well-intentioned thing? Um, and, and you know, you say in the book, ignore any frustration you may feel with the terminology if it doesn't immediately connect with you, and just come to the rationality behind it, which is that you're just trying to find simple tools to make us healthy and happy. But it's really hard, it's isn't it? And you, you'll know better than anyone to sort of disassociate this notion of what you're doing from what it gets connected with, which is kind of elitism and the fact that it's expensive and time consuming and a way of life that's only available to some, to a, to a lucky few. 1000%. And I think it's, it's been very, very, very interesting watching the, and as I said, it's exactly what I said in the book. And I, I really feel it. it's the word wellness. I don't know what other word to use, but the word wellness is so nuanced. It's become so complicated. It has just so many different meanings to people. And I think to some people, it is so off-putting and it means weird and wacky and just not for them. It doesn't mean lentils and carrots, which is a is a problem because we we kind of need it to and i think that this for me is the challenge is that over the last kind of 10 years or so this space has completely exploded and the challenge is is that what's interesting is what's weird and what's wacky and what's new and what's different and that's what makes headlines and that's what makes interesting articles um and i totally understand that carrots and lentils and chickpeas aren't that interesting um and so as a result, I think this world has become very, very synonymous with the kind of superfood concept and kind of crazy LA concepts and things that cost hundreds and hundreds of pounds, if not more. And that's so inaccessible and it's also not necessary. And I think that's the challenge. And the more that I've explored this space, the more you understand that actually it's sleep that makes a difference to our health. It, it's movement and it's not movement like expensive, complicated gym classes. It's going for walks and like simple stretches. And it is making, you know, simple 10 minute meals with your simple ingredients like chickpeas and potatoes and broccoli. But it's just, that's not always that interesting to talk about. And as a result, I think it has become quite a divided space. But then if you look, come back and you look at why we need it not to be a divided space, and I think it is interesting seeing the conversations, for example, around coronavirus at the moment, and we know that obviously, elderly aside, lifestyle related diseases can make it a more challenging illness. And, you know, there's a links to obesity and things like that. And, you know, one in, only one in four adults in the UK now manages to get their five a day. And we, we know that really we should be aiming above that. It's only one in five children. And so we, we do want to, and we should be aiming to change that. And, but then this world has become so off-putting to so many people. And so how do we change that? And how do we bring it back? And how do we make healthy something that isn't synonymous with complicated, expensive niche concepts and make it interesting and exciting and delicious, but actually doable on a day-to-day -day basis? And that's, that is so incredibly important. Um, it really, really is. And it's something, yeah, that, that we're very, very passionate about um, because, because it, we do need to be eating more of these kinds of foods. And there's a reason that we don't. And part of it is that people still think it's so boring. You know, I think, again, one of the other issues is that the idea of health and healthy eating has become, again, also very synonymous with dieting. And we have such an ingrained sense of kind of diet culture in the world today. And changing that's really, really hard. And people always want rules and they want regulations. And, you know, that's where that whole debate about clean eating came in is it's like, oh, clean versus dirty. You know, like if you eat broccoli, you can't eat pizza. And, and that's not sustainable for people. It's got to be a genuinely balanced, enjoyable way of life where, yes, you are eating your broccoli, but you're doing it in a way that you look forward to doing it because it actually tastes good and it's got loads of flavor and we never boil broccoli ever again. You know, we fry it with sesame oil and garlic and chili and ginger and have it with noodles and miso and like loads of flavor. And that's how that's how we start doing it. Um, but but it is it is a really, really, really complicated topic and it, it can be incredibly heated. And um, yeah, it's been a very interesting one to navigate. I mean, there are so many, you've said so many of the things in there exactly that are the sort of navigation places you have to navigate and the notions of diet, as you say, 
actually it puts people off in some ways this idea of a diet because it, it makes you think of restrictions and denial and you know delicious liella as a brand is not about that at all it's it's, it's never been about calorie restriction has it it's quite you know no, never. And that's, I think for, for me personally, that's always been my biggest frustration as any criticism in that space. Like we have never talked about calories. We've never shared, we will never share a before and after picture. We are not a brand about diets. And I very much believe that for anything to be sustainable in your life, it's, it's got to feel doable and feeling doable means flavor. And it means, do you actually want this for dinner? Because we know that diets don't work. Every every study ever made shows that so you've got to be looking at what you want to do day in day out and that means flavor and that means satisfaction on a mental and physical level you know and i think we have to completely change that we need to think about healthy eating as looking after ourselves every single day and that's going to change every single day as to what you want and what you need and that's great and there isn't good and there isn't bad and there isn't i'm never doing this again it's just how can we add more in and i think that's what's really interesting is every all the time people say oh what's the one thing i shouldn't do what's the one thing i should change what's the one thing i should cut out and and i know it sounds a bit cheesy and i know it sounds a bit cliche but i think why like, why can't we focus on the positive side? What's the one thing you can do? What's the one thing you can add in? And I feel like if you start thinking about it like that, it feels like something that you can do in the long term. Like, can you just add an extra portion of vegetables in? And again, like when we think about vegetables, it really, and people immediately think of like a green salad with grated carrot and cucumber and lettuce and tomatoes. And you don't want to eat that every day. That's not filling. That's not satisfying. Um, and again, I think that has to change and we have to, yeah, we have to become more accepting of that, both for our own health, because we know we need to do more of this, but also for the health of the planet. Like we, we do need to take up a more vegetarian diet. And again, we do know that statistically speaking, and, and we, we got to help people do it by making it delicious and exciting, because if it's not, it's just not going to last. It, it's really interesting. Actually, funnily enough, I've I've been interviewing a lot of people about that association between um, plant-based diet and the planet for the last four months, and it's just emphasised again and again. And I know it wasn't why you, in a way, first came into it, but the importance of eating like this to save the environment is, is huge. But can I just go back to, um, you know, you have, as you say, there's a hard balance because there are continual worries about obesity and diabetes. Um, and a wish to promote health and, and exercise. And then on the other side, there's, you know, eating disorders and people who take it always, you know, too far. And you can take a vegan diet too far because it's obviously, you know, telling people to restrict stuff in some ways. And I know that you faced a, a, a bit of a backlash for that. But I've heard you say you feel that that was possibly a lot to do with being female and that you don't think a man would really have ever faced that sort of criticism is is that right I mean, do you think if it had been deliciously matt that the criticism would have been there it's a really interesting one i mean i think i think it was definitely more than that and but i think it was interesting because the the only people critic who really ever get criticized in this space are all women mm -hmm. and there's a lot of men who i think by the way also doing really amazing things but who exist in this space and often much more in a dieting space who are never ever ever bought into it and i think it is it was hard not to notice that and be kind of acutely aware of that and i think that is quite interesting um and a point that yes yeah, i said it was it was hard to escape because it it didn't completely make sense um but as you said it's it's a really difficult balance to strike and ultimately the thing is is that it's not different to what i was saying a minute ago in the sense of like the weird and wacky make headlines and yeah. the problem is is what the reality is is like it's just about balance like ultimately and and you know one of the things i've enjoyed most at delicious yellow is doing the delicious yellow podcast and being able to interview all kinds of experts on everything from you know our mental health and, and interesting neurologists in that space to sleep experts to um researchers looking at you know how exercise affects the brain and, and all the rest of it and i think what I've come to realize so much is that our health mentally and physically is so dependent actually on incredibly simple practices like 
you know, just trying to have a sleep and trying to have 10 minutes of calm in your day and breathing. And it, it isn't the weird and the wacky. And it is again, and it's the same with where we, how we eat It is trying to find a sensible balance where we do really try and, you know, up our fruit and veggie intake. And, you know, there's interesting research at the moment around gut health and to, for kind of really optimal gut health, having 30 different plant-based foods in your diet every week. Yeah. Um, not just fruit and veggies, just different nuts and seeds and um, legumes and pulses and things like that. So that really helps your gut microbiomes and helps to create diversity in your gut um, and create the best environment that you can have for your gut health. And, but you know, that that's just about eating chickpeas and butter beans and black beans. And it's, it's really, really, you know, in that sense, it's actually quite simple and it's just a bit boring. And it is just about genuinely finding a sense of balance that suits you in your life. I think it's really interesting you talk about intuitive eating um, and the idea <clears throat> that is the most simple of all things, you're letting, letting go and listening to your, to your body and what it needs and, and what feels right. And you say, I think it's in your book that, that pregnancy and early motherhood were the best teachers for you of kind of truly getting that concept. Um, and I think it's quite refreshing for people to hear that. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that why, why did pregnancy show you to listen to your body? What, what did that do to your eating? I think it just changed things more than anything else ever has. I mean, when I was pregnant with Sky, as I said earlier, I had really bad sickness. And I literally, and I, I'm, honestly, I'm not exaggerating, looking at broccoli made me gag. Um, I could not eat anything green, even a tiny bit, for almost four months. I could only eat potatoes of every form, mashed, boiled, roasted, chips, crisps, bread, any kind of bread, um, basically anything white. And that, that was it. I just could not stomach it. It made me feel so, 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 so ill. I tried one day to make a soup because I felt like it was not great that I hadn't had any vegetables in, in like two weeks. And I just came, just couldn't even swallow a bite of it. It just made me so sick. And it's, it was just a really interesting learning in the fact that, you know, you, you just, what can you do? You just got to embrace it. And, um, you know, same, those completely exhausting couple of first couple of months where you don't really know what's up and what's down, you know, you've, you've got to let go and, and you, you can't do all the things you're used to doing. And like, even if it is just a simple exercise class, like that's, that's not going to happen. And I think it's, it was a really lovely lesson in just, like that's where you are and that's where you are in any given time. And, and that can be a great thing. And it, I think it was again, a lesson in the fact that like what you need at any given time changes all the time. And that's why I think this need that we have in our culture today of rules of regulations of eat this, don't eat that, eat this much of this at this time that we do look for quite a lot. And that is, you know, very ingrained in, in dieting it's just not it's not realistic because what you need and what i need today is different and and same tomorrow and the next day and every single person listening to this and you know i get questions all the time from people like oh what do you eat in a day show me exactly what you eat in a day i, I want to do what you do and it's like well i'm pregnant at the moment so that's you know that's different enough as it is but also you know, so unrealistic. Like, have you just sat in a chair for 13 hours or have you been walking around doing this, doing that? Like, what are you craving? What do you want? What did you eat yesterday? Like, it's, I think we do, yeah, I, it's, it's really challenging. And I definitely feel that, that there's a responsibility to be very clear about the fact that we are all different and there's a lot to learn and there's a lot of shared information about what is good for us as human beings. But there's also a lot of individualism that comes in. And I think it is, really hard to let go of almost a lot of what's ingrained in us but i think it is incredibly important and as you said it's interesting with a vegan diet and a plant-based diet because in some ways you know as much as i i personally don't believe that it's necessarily the right thing for everyone to become a vegan it's definitely not our message at delicious yellow it's much more about encouraging more and open-mindedness to having just much more of this food in your life rather than saying it's a you know one or the other but as you said, some people would feel it was restrictive because you're obviously not, if you are following a plant-based diet, then you're not eating, you know, meat and you're not eating dairy. Um, but at the same time, I think it can be really creative and it's definitely, I have found made me more creative with my cooking and I've really enjoyed that aspect of it. 
And you say, I and mean, we've talked, to, you've touched a lot on mental health and sleep, sleep, and various parts of that. And, and it's, it's, you know, incredibly important to you. And I know particularly over recent years that what we eat is actually just one piece of this great big puzzle. Um, and you, you know, you've said, well, I think you said lots of times that you can eat all the broccoli in the world and still feel awful. And you you say that sort of your mental health, in fact, was incredibly damaged by that by that illness, and perhaps it's that that's taken you longer to recover from. Um, do, do you feel that you're sort of much more along the road to, to recovery where that's concerned? Yeah, absolutely. And it is interesting. I felt like physically my health got better in a couple of years, and I felt like the darkness that had happened at the beginning of the illness and the low self-esteem and the very low view of myself and the lack of confidence has taken a lot, 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 lot longer to rebuild. And Delicious Yella gave me such a sense of purpose and a reason for being and an excitement, which I will forever be so grateful for. And it's probably why I feel such a kind of personal responsibility to it as well. Um, but then at the same time, it took off so, so, so quickly when I was very young and probably, I don't know if you can ever really be prepared for it, but I, I wasn't prepared for it in any shape or form. It was just so, so incredibly unexpected. Um, and I think I found it incredibly overwhelming and it was a strange mix of obviously like unbelievable gratitude for the opportunities that were coming my way. And more than I could have ever, ever, ever dreamed of. And, you know, I was never really expected myself to have a particularly successful career. I never really viewed myself in that way. And so suddenly I was had achieved more than I kind of thought I ever might in my life. And that was a very strange thing. But then at the same time, I think I had a real sense of kind of imposter syndrome and I'm not really ready for this. And I felt quite terrified by people, you know, someone who didn't have necessarily the highest self-esteem at that point. I felt very nervous around other people having opinions of me and people talking about me rather than to me. Um, and I did make the mistake of reading like the Daily Mail comments a couple of times, um, which I'll never do again. <laughs> um, and because um, they're not that nice. And um, and that, yeah, I, it, that's been a, that has been quite an interesting, interesting lesson. And I've really taken a lot personally from everything I've learned through Delicious Yellow about our mental health. And that, that thing, you know, about caring so much, what, what people think of you, I think someone who made you really try to stop that and see things in a different life was Matt. I mean, you said that when Matt came along, it was a huge part of a sort of shift um, in your mindset. And I was just saying to you before, I, you know, I've heard you tell a story and people might not know, but Matt coming into your life was, was truly something that we, happens in maybe Richard Curtis films but perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about about how that happened yeah I mean honestly it's like it, it is ridiculous and sometimes I'm almost like not embarrassed saying it but because it's just like in retrospect it's a ridiculous story but we we met actually through work he was working um on a project and was interested in what I was doing and our parents actually worked together his mum and my dad and he was interested in Delicious Yellow. He read an article, I think, in the Sunday Times about Delicious Yellow. And he emailed my dad saying, could you put me in touch? And I'd just broken out with my boyfriend of about four and a bit years. I was certainly not looking for a relationship. And I got this very long email from my dad telling me this. I just had to meet this man. And he was so handsome. And here's a picture of him. And isn't he amazing? And I thought this was a little bit weird. And um, anyway, I went, went to meet him and I came back and I said to actually the very first person that ever worked with me, so she said I was become one of my best friends and she was still working with me at that time. And I said to her, I was like, God, that is the kind of guy that you marry. I think that that would be him. And um, we went out on a date and we went out on a second, on a Thursday, we went out a second date on a Sunday and we moved in together the following Thursday. Um, that was the end of March. And by the 1st of August, we were engaged. We were living together. We'd got a dog and we decided to um, start working together. So um, it was quite a roller coaster. We were married within the year. It's been um, five and a half years now. So luckily, so far, so good. Um, but um, yeah, it was, I never believed in love at first sight or anything like that. So I was kind of really confused and quite skeptical in some senses of, of what happened. But it was just, it was amazing. I think when when we decided we would start working together, I think people did, it did raise quite a lot of eyebrows um, with friends and family. That was quite a rash 
decision, but it was honestly, it was the best decision we ever made because my complete passion is for obviously for, for what we do at delicious yellow and the reasons behind it and trying to inspire people to, to eat a little bit better and, and to try and try and change that. But Matt, I had no, I, you know, I literally didn't know the first thing about business. I started delicious yellow when I was at university. So I've never had another job and I started interviewing people and I literally, I had no idea what to ask them. I was honestly asking them whether they were nice, whether they liked quinoa, um, whether they liked avocados. I mean, it was that, it was that basic basically. And I, I really, really needed some help. And, and I think what I realized really, really quickly is there was a lot of incoming as delicious yellow had taken off and it had a lot of kind of media attention behind it there was a lot of incoming for licensing and for basically making delicious yellow a marketing vehicles a marketing vehicle for other companies and i guess to some extent going down that kind of influencer kind of blog route and i realized really quickly i didn't i didn't want to do that i wanted to be in control of my own career and of delicious yellow and i wanted delicious yellow to be its own entity and not a marketing vehicle for anybody else and um and but i didn't have any business know-how i didn't have any experience whatsoever and matt matt's a little bit older and he'd been working in finance and he'd been running a company with a friend and he had that experience and so it felt like a really good match in that sense as well and, and it really has been i mean he now he's now the ceo of delicious yellow so technically he's the boss and um and um he um he runs our our kind of day-to-day -day. you know he manages our team and he oversees our finance functions and cash flow forecasts and supply chain and manufacturing and all the all the cogs that actually make delicious yellow turn and it also then allows me to to do what i absolutely love which is the recipe side of it the events how it looks how it feels how it shows up and the kind of the the community and and the feel of delicious yellow still and it, it it's what it has it has worked pretty well so far and um, we've the time has raised past but you know your life um with matt and, and your life ever since that you've you've blogged about and it's been very and you you're very open um online about the ups and downs and i, I you know we haven't time to necessarily talk about that i know there's been a lot of, of of hard times and people who think you've you know got this sort of perfect instagram life will also know that if they've been following you, you know, you had a very difficult time when Matt's mother very, very sadly died. I know you've been through difficulties with, with your own family. All of this is essentially something that you open up about on, on, on social media. And we talked about social media at the beginning. How do you find that relation, your relationship with it? Because Instagram, which is really, you know, where it's obviously at for you is innately important to your business and your brand. And it's been with you all the way. It's where you began. And there's such love for what you do, as I say, I see, see the comments, but I just wonder how, how much you, how you get that balance right, because you must question it, you know, how much does being on social media in that way kind of impact your mental health? And, and, you know, do you get enjoyment out of it or are there times where you feel like it's a sort of duty? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question. And I think social media is a fascinating space. And I think it has, has got so many positives and it has got negatives and it has got, you know, like should come with health warnings. And I definitely agree with that. Um, there's a comparison culture that it can create that's, that's not positive. And it, it's for that reason that I think it is important to share the reality. But then at the same time, I think one of the things that I found quite interesting about that is so often you can't actually share the reality when it's the reality because it's not appropriate for so many reasons. And I think that's one of the reasons that social media can sometimes feel off to some extent is that, you know, like I know, for example, like when, when Matt's mum first got ill, you know, obviously that's not something we can share on social media. I mean, from family, that's so much to digest for her. That's so much to digest it happened in May and September around the time of her birthday, she decided she actually, she was a politician and a public figure and she really wanted to enact change around brain cancer because there had been very, very little progression in that space. And so she wanted to talk about it. And so we said, of course, you know, we'll talk about it. Of course, we'll support that and we'll support you in that. And, you know, she, she did remarkable things in the following eight months or so in, in terms of increasing funding and research and things in brain cancer. And it was a kind of complete 
amazing it was amazing 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 thing to watch and but it's you know it's not it's not my it's my job to go on and share that kind of thing and I think that's you know and I remember my parents when they said they were getting divorced and the next day kind of sharing a picture of porridge on social media and it was kind of questioned it but then I thought but it's not I can't go online and, and tell people that my parents are getting divorced they won't have told their, all their friends that you know it's not this isn't my news this isn't my life and I can't I can't share that and it's the same with work you know like as you know, in the beginning when Matt and I first were kind of really turning to each other into, into a company, you know, we had several times and it's, there's quite a lot about it in our last cookbook, in the plant-based cookbook, you know, that we really felt like we were quite close to going out of business and, and we really were a couple of times. You can't share that at the time, you know, we're really stressed. You know, what are people who are working with us going to think, you know, and what are our suppliers going to think, you know, it's not, it's not the kind of thing you can share and so in some create in some senses it creates a false reality around social media in that sense but i do think for me it's important when you can share and when appropriate to share that you do share a bit of it to show that there is a reality but then at the same time i think we all need a bit of a pick me up and positivity and i, I wouldn't be able to share that as well i don't think you need to see like the day-to-day -day, like nuanced annoyances of someone's life um but I have been quite clear from the beginning that whilst I am really happy to share anything that I think is a helpful resource in anything to do with health and wellness in that sense that's, that's delicious yellow related, I do. And I guess it's surprising in some ways to have so many people following us and, and to say this, but I do try and keep a lot private. You know, we don't share our home. I don't talk about what I'm wearing. We don't share our family, our friends, like, you might share what we're cooking with them, but but nothing else. And and in that sense, it's it's not because there's anything going on. It's particularly interesting, to be honest. Our life is very small and, and quite boring, really. But um, it's just that I think it's it's important for me that everything that we share is related to delicious Ciela in some capacity in, into health and into wellness, and that there is a kind of a boundary between the two. And it's been really great you know for, for for mothers i think that you've shared a lot of your mothering and and been very honest about pregnancy and, and and around you know you've talked about the food things around pregnancy but i think that um through your following you sort of are consciously perhaps trying to dispel some myths around a motherhood that it's all perfect and oh god it's not at all yeah i mean i i was really to be honest i was really shocked by pregnancy and i think it's a very very difficult topic because it's unfortunately you know it's very common to to struggle to get pregnant and so obviously you know it's a hard thing to say it's hard because it's such a huge blessing and such a privilege but but it is it physically and, and emotionally as a result it, it is quite hard and there's all sorts of weird things that happen when you're pregnant that I just was not expecting and like aches and pains and cankles and you know all the rest of it and um i do think you need a, we need a bit more reality because i think you're expecting this kind of sense of kind of glowing and and actually you feel i've at least felt especially with the last pregnancy that i was waddling much more than i was glowing <laughs> most of the time um and and same you know same with early motherhood i mean i spent the first two weeks wearing incontinence nappies because that was so much more comfortable than anything else because it's like a bit sore and you know it's just things like that and but you know you never see things like that and I do think it's it is important because that that is what reality looks like and again I just I think with these these kind of moments we often don't don't see enough of that because people don't want to make it look like they're not grateful for something which is incredible but something can be incredible and a huge blessing but also have challenges associated with it yeah, of course. And I think you I think you posted a lovely picture of you in the incontinence. <laughs> now I think lying on the sofa. It was lovely. Um I must I must come to the questions. I just want to ask you very lastly, and you've said it's you know become much more mainstream what you do and it's no longer niche. There's more and more competition in the space. And I just wonder you know how you and I'm sure you talk about it all the time amongst amongst yourselves how, how do you think you propose to sort of stay unique and original and and kind of you know to have your own sort of USP, I suppose, going forward. What what is that? Do you know what Matt and I were talking about exactly that this afternoon? It's um yeah, it's it's hard in a way because it's yeah, the space has become increasingly busy and busy and busy. And you know, even like in the supermarkets, 
you know, we're now sitting next to a version of sort of what we do made by the massive brands like Galaxy and Kellogg's. And, you know, we are tiny, tiny, tiny. And so competing against them is, is hard. And there's no kind of two ways around that. And I think for us, it just, it's about staying really true to our principles of, of trying to promote delicious, but completely natural plant-based food and trying to be useful. And that's, you know, we have three whys in our business. We want to, we want to make vegetables cool. You know, we want to train, change the preconception around that. We want to help people live better and we want to be a genuinely useful resource and we'll never do anything at Delicious Ciela that doesn't tick that box. You know, we're not going to sell things for the sake of it. We're not going to be marketing vehicles for other companies. We're not going to just sell you t-shirts and caps because we can, we want to be helpful. And I think that helps, I guess, us hopefully stay relevant in people's lives because we genuinely provide something that people are looking for. Um, and I have to say, someone hugely grateful that when in the age you could jump on aeroplanes and stuff, it, it's sort of an extraordinary thing that you can find one of your trustworthy kind of cereal bars that you can just grab from a WH Smith, which, you know, you really, really couldn't do so very long ago. And that, that's the one thing I'm going to have to move. The questions are, bit, are absolutely um, piling up and I, I'm going to tick, tick all mine off. Um, but uh, let me just choose one to sort of start just for, about the, the new book and if people are asking about that what your favorite recipe is from that book um i think i'd have to go with the most popular that so far of what i've made for other people which is the um, mushroom and walnut ragu it's in the big batch chapter it's really really easy to make but it's it's been a massive hit and i've been recipe testing on a group of girlfriends literally since the very very beginning of delicious Yella, and this is their favorite recipe ever so i think that's got to be got to be the winner some of these questions are brilliant i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm sorry if i hate, don't answer them all and some very practical cooking questions but um someone says and i think you answered do you, do you still reply you know we talked a little bit about this extraordinary engagement you have with instagram do, do you still reply to, to, to the majority of messages on there so i still personally run all our social media channels no one else we don't we've never hired anyone in social media which Maybe one day we'll need to change, but so far it's always just me. And I, I don't now get to them all. I had to relinquish that about a year ago, but I try, I spend an hour or two every single day getting through as many as I physically can. And there was a question on here. I, I've, I've lost it now, but I'm going to ask it because it's something I'm really interested in. I'm sure a lot of people feel this and they, they were wondering how we can get our parents to eat healthily. And I am sure a lot of people struggle with the frustrations, I know I do, of, of, of trying not to sort of be too instructive to parents who have very, very different views um, about how they eat and, and don't want to listen. And we all want to sort of protect and preserve our parents. It's a frustration for a lot of people, I know that. Yeah, no, totally. And I know people find this as well with partners um, or with flatmates and, and people trying to persuade people that this food isn't as strange as you think it might be and I I've definitely had that and I think for me it was never about telling anyone anything I never try and tell anyone the health benefits of anything or you know do you know this about the environment never ever ever I really really focus on flavor and I try and cook for people and that made such a big difference in just saying you know, I've made this, do you want to try it? And I never say, oh, I've made this vegan meal because people would say, I don't want that. But you start describing it and all the herbs and the spices and, you know, cooking it in onion and garlic and simmering it in coconut milk and make it sound delicious and then give it to them. And again, focusing on things that are kind of heartier and more filling and never salads. Um, that's That has really, really helped. Because I think when you try some of the food and you realize it's got so much flavor and texture, you suddenly think, oh, this isn't as weird as I thought. And and also just being really accepting of putting things on the sides. You know, this isn't about trying to, you know, I think I, I did that a lot. I try and persuade people in the flavor and in the recipes, but then make other things that were familiar to them for sides or, you know, make that ragu, but have Parmesan with it for them. And it suddenly doesn't make it weird at all. Yeah. Um, so someone says, uh, if you were to start again from scratch, and it's a big question, but is there, and I'm sure there are things you would do differently, but perhaps you could just pick, you know, one, one big thing, because I'm sure, I'm sure there are many, and you've spoken about those. 
Oh my God, there's so many things I would have done differently. It's unbelievable. I think our biggest thing, honestly, was that we we had a massive change when when we first started working together. We thought what we wanted to do was open like 30 delis, basically, and we really quickly up, opened a couple, and we realized that that wasn't what we wanted to do. We wanted to make products in supermarkets, and the delis came with a whole interesting host of challenges, but also it felt uh, we didn't feel we could get what we wanted to as many people as possible that way. And on a really practical note, you know, it would have meant huge investment into the company and we would have owned so little of delicious yellow as a result. And we didn't want to do that. And so I think, I think that was, that was our, that's probably both of our biggest regret is um, spending a lot of time down one path when actually another path was probably more right. Mm -hmm. Um, someone asks, and I'm interested in this too, do you take all the photos, your food photos yourself, and what would be your tips? This person says that her pictures always come out a bit rubbish. So yeah, I did to start with, oh my God, you should have seen my first pictures. They were so horrendous. Um, that was one of my biggest learnings. And um, I was so devastated actually because I spilt water on my first laptop and I had nothing backed up. So I don't have any of those pictures anymore, but they really were hideous. Um, I don't know why anyone read the blog on the first few days, to be honest with you. But I did up until it was about two years ago or so when I realized, again, I couldn't do absolutely everything. And so we brought in um, a freelance photographer who does a couple of days a week with us. And she she does a lot of the photos now. And it's actually something I quite miss. I really, really enjoyed it. But I, yeah, I was trying to do, I was trying to wear about 45 different hats every single day and it was, it was a bit much. Um, a, a common theme is, uh, and I think I know the answer to this about where the mat is plant-based. I think he's, he's, yeah. Yeah. So we're completely plant-based at home and, you know, sometimes we'll try something in a restaurant or when we're traveling and things like that. Um, but yeah, we're totally plant-based at home. People always ask us about sky as well and what we'll do and and for that one we as i said we're plant-based at home but i feel very strongly she's more than welcome to make any decision that she likes as she she gets older i think you know how you eat is such a personal decision and, and not my duty to tell her what to do by any means i mean obviously i'll explain why why i do it and hopefully she'll really enjoy the food but if she wants to do other things as well then that's completely her prerogative have i heard you say that the biggest sort of dis difference between you and that is that he doesn't like hummus oh my god it's, it's devastating <laughs> he hates hummus and he hates avocados and i've had this really weird pregnancy craving for like kimchi and sauerkraut and he hates those and they they do stink and so that really freaks him out because the, the fridge smells really strongly of kimchi at the moment so that is um yeah that that is a source of, of contention in our life um but also the fact that he's very like practical and i i, I kind of get more interested in i guess the more kind of you could call them woo woo sides of of health and wellness so the other night we were lying in bed and he was plugged into some advanced excel course learning some super spreadsheet modeling tool and i was reading a book about our chakras um and we were both trying to tell the other one about what we were learning and the other one was just so phenomenally disinterested <laughs> um a lot of people ask and we touched on it but but perhaps um you know more detail they're, they're wanting which is that where you see your deliciously ella and people have you know invariably said five or, or ten years time do you know what? I struggle so much with the question because I never would have seen us here five years from five years ago. I mean, the amount that we've grown in that time, I just, yeah, I never ever would have seen that. So it's hard to say. I think we always say as long as we're being useful, then we'll be here and we'll keep doing it. Um, I really hope that once coronavirus subsides in some way, we are able to start really expanding overseas and, and be able to be in America and across Europe. And I think the two of us would love to spend some time in America and, and really take delicious yellow over there. I absolutely love California. Like I, I love LA so, so much. I just, I think it's the, um, the weather. And so I'm like really petitioning to, um, to take delicious yellow out there for a bit. I'm so reluctantly going to have to sort of call it a day, but I'm just going to, I shouldn't do this, but I just want to, because someone says that, can you say hello to someone called Marion Riley? Because it would make her weak if you did. 
<laughs> oh, hi, Marion. Thanks for tuning in. And thank you guys all so, so much for listening today. I hope you do love the book if you get it. And um, yeah, let us know which recipes you're making. Thank you so much for me, for all, to all of you for, for joining us. And Ella, thank you very, very much. Thank you.